Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our webinar today, Journey from Corporates to Health Tech Startups, presented by SG Innovate and Access Health International. My name is Brian, and for those of you who don't know about us, we are a government-owned organization in Singapore that invests in and helps build deep tech startups, talent, and communities. At SG Innovate, our work involves connecting with the global deep tech ecosystem, working with entrepreneurial scientists to bring their innovative research from lab to market, as well as developing deep tech talent. Today, we have a group of amazing speakers who will be sharing about their experience leaving their corporate careers behind to join or establish their own health tech startups. I'd like to encourage our audience here today to share their thoughts on this topic and engage with our speakers by using the Q&A box below. And with no further ado, I'll now pass the time to our moderator for today, uh, Adrian. Adrian, please. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today on this Friday afternoon as you wrap up your weeks and or wrap up your work week. Um, this is one of, of many webinars that we've done with SGA Innovate through our Health Futures Network, um, through which we look at innovations from the corporate sector, startups, development, and, um, and also government as well to look at the future of healthcare. And the reason why I wanted to host this, this event today in this panel discussion is I've long been inspired by the very people on this panel and for quite a while have been looking for a good excuse to bring them all together to have a discussion on what is the future of health technologies, health technologies in Asia? Why did they leave the corporate positions that they had um, and decide that, you know what, I see this gap. Um, that I think can be better filled through a startup journey or by working with a startup, founding a new company potentially as well, um, or working with other startups. Um, so wanted to learn more about that journey um, and, and uh, how they got to where they are right now, the advantages that they're seeing, et cetera, and also seeing that that could be inspiration for other startups. What can we learn from the people who, who left the corporate world and decided to uh, join a startup? So without going into um, too much more detail on my side, because I have not left a corporation to join a startup, I'm not the person who you're here to listen to today, um, I would like to introduce our panelists today. Um, we have Gaba, who I have known for years and have never figured out how to pronounce his last name. So I will let him do that. Um, he's joining us from New Zealand, so I apologize for the fact that this is part of your Friday night. Um, and no wine yet. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> um, and then we also have Farhana Nakuda, uh, Suhina Singh, and Reynal De Silva as well. So, um, you know, I'm just going to let you, each one of you, one by one, um, just give an introduction about yourself, what your prior experience was, was that, what that corporate background was, um, and why you decided to make this leap um, into the startup world. So, Gaba, let's start with you. Cool. Well, look, hi, everyone, and uh, Adrian, thanks for having me today. It's great to be here. Um, it's sort of an interesting sort of journey. I, I guess I... I found computers and technology at a very young age uh, and I just sort of swore that I was going to be in the computer field and, and that's what I did and, and pretty much as soon as I left school I went and started businesses using tech and then eventually found myself in Australia and eventually found myself at Microsoft where I spent 20 years across the US, Australia and Singapore and I was an accidental entrant into health but one of those things that you find a passion for is ultimately what drives you. And health just stood out to me as this industry that had lots of interesting problems and really struggled to solve them. And I like interesting problems. So, so leaning in hard on, on being able to do that um, excited me. And so I've ne never been able to leave health. So although I've left corporate life, um, working and moving across to, to healthcare um, is something that I can't, can't escape from. Um, at Microsoft, I didn't initially start in health. Um, I started in a whole bunch of uh, technical sales, um, consulting roles, and so forth. Um, but that's where I that's where I ended up, and I ended up leading Microsoft's healthcare business across Asia for about uh, 12, 12 years there. Excellent, thank you. Um, and and now moving to Farhana. Sure. So, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. And thanks, Adrian, as well, for inviting me to be part of this. 
Um, so my background is I, I started off, my degree was in biology, in fact, biochemistry, molecular biology, and I worked in medical research, and I realized very early that I was never going to be a medical researcher. I didn't like rats and microscopes and being isolated in a lab. I love people that do that. We need people in the world to do that, but that was just not my personality. I'm a people person. Um, and so I actually went from that, and I did, um, after that, I got my MBA, and I joined IBM, and it was just at a time where they were starting a life sciences division, and, you know, they were looking kind of at the bio, biotech industries, and my actual passion has always been healthcare, and so I kind of joined IBM and life sciences, but the minute I saw there was a healthcare team, I kind of jumped over, and then over the next few years, they kind of gave me both and said, okay, you do healthcare and life sciences, so like, like GABA, I, um, led the healthcare business for IBM for about 18 years, kind of covering Asia Pacific and then growth markets. Um, and it was a fantastic experience, you know, working in a big company like that, um, getting exposure all over the world. Um, but what happened was, is that, um, you know, I, I basically had been traveling around Asia, meeting a lot of hospitals, healthcare systems, and I noticed that there was this common interest. And at the time in IBM, I was talking a lot about Watson because Watson was our big thing at the time. And everyone was talking about leveraging their own data and using their data to improve outcomes. But I didn't see anything in this market in Asia Pacific that could do that. And it just so happened um, that a friend of mine on Facebook, believe it or not, posted about a company in the US that was a billion dollar unicorn and uh, about to go IPO, and, uh, and I read about it, and I was on my way to HIMSS, and I met up with uh, this company, Health Catalyst, and I was just completely blown away, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly what this market needs, um, and then to kind of top it all off, my, my ex-boss and IBM gave me a book called um, Ikigai, which is, if you haven't read it, highly recommend it. It's a Japanese term for finding your passion and purpose in life. And I basically realized that I just wanna join a company that is just dedicated and focused on healthcare. And you know, the company that I joined, when I joined, it was a startup. Um, we did IPO in 2019, but you know, we're still a startup in Asia Pacific, I would say. Um, but yeah, it filled a gap in the market. It was very much within where my passion lies. Um, and that's how I ended up here. So that's my story. Great, thank you. Um, and now moving on to Suhina. Um, you have even more of a background of doctor to corporate to startup. So I'd love to hear that. Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for having me and hi everyone. So uh, yeah, actually my, uh, my journey is quite a, an interesting one. It actually went from doctor to, to startup to corporate back to the world of startup, uh, which is very surprising. Um, so I was a, I was a physician, I think what really kickstarted my journey was I, you know, as a really young physician, I got super frustrated working in the public healthcare system within South Africa. Um, more often than not, like some days working in the emergency room, we didn't have medication because we ran out or, you know, there would be a three, four month old baby HIV negative that was severely dehydrated and had passed away when there's no reason for such a kid to, to have passed away. Uh, and it's just because they didn't have access to healthcare. And, you know, a part of me as a young physician was, you know, um, really wanted to be able to try and change this in some shape or form. And I think that sort of led me to, uh, to the UK. Uh, went and studied further in, in, in the UK and practiced as a physician there. Um, life, unfortunately, didn't lead me back to South Africa, but it did lead me to Asia um, and, uh, in my journey here, I did a number of different things. Um, I did land up in a startup which had nothing to do with healthcare for a brief moment in time. And for me, working in the startup was as if someone helped to switch the lights on uh, because for the first time in that tech startup, what I realized what actually, all, a lot of the problems that I faced as a young physician in, the, in, in South Africa and some of the problems I faced in, in the UK, um, Actually, tech could play a really, really huge um, part in solving some of these issues. Um, and so for me, that was an absolutely phenomenal uh, two years. Um, I then went off and I was trying to do my own health tech startup, um, at which point uh, Pharma sort of knocked on the door. Um, and I said, oh, you know what? 
what better opportunity to join corporate and actually understand the pharma perspective. And, and sort of that's led me into my career in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so I spent about five years in pharma doing a number of different roles. And I also did that and I embraced that on purpose because I truly wanted to understand the perspective from the pharmaceutical industry. Um, you know, fast forward to, to last year, I was doing my executive MBA at, 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 at NCI. Um, and, you know, one of the professors um, asked us, you know, where do you see yourself in 10 years and what is your, what is your, what is your purpose? Um, and, you know, it's, it's almost as if the penny dropped at that point in time. Um, and after getting so frustrated of seeing the misallocation of capital and health tech or startups that were struggling just because they didn't either have the right connections or because they struggled with, with healthcare expertise, it just seemed silly not to, to jump ship um, and actually try and help um, and ensure that, you know, that there's some really great startups that never get funding. Um, so really looking to see see how can we change that so that innovation is not uh, not lost. Um, and so that leads me to, to where I am today. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I'm excited to get more into that conversation on the, the investor conversation as well. Um, Reynold, last but not least. Um... Thank you, Adrian. Uh, hi, everyone. Good to be here today. Uh, a few words about myself. I started my career in a, in a, what you might consider a very unhealthy profession. My first job was making cocktails in a bar. And at that time I was working with the Taj group of hotels uh, and eventually started managing uh, restaurants and bars uh, for them. In the nineties, I was working with Taj in Bangalore. It had just started to become the Silicon Valley of India. And we had a lot of people coming and staying at our hotels, coming from the actual Silicon Valley to start up uh, you know, their back offices and hire engineers and so on. And we kept getting feedback saying, why don't you have internet? So it gives you a bit of a sense of uh, how long back that was. Uh, it wasn't that long back, although it feels longer. Uh, so one day my general manager called me and said, look, uh, you spend a lot of time uh, you know, with computers. Uh, can you figure out what is this internet thing and what should we do about it? So that's how I got started on this journey. Uh, I had set up the first internet access point for the Taj group of hotels in Bangalore. When I taught myself a bit of programming, uh, realized that this wasn't that hard to do. And then I founded my own startup to help more hotels and restaurants get onto the internet back then. That started well, but it did not go well. And so I ended up closing it uh, and deciding that I needed to learn more about business. And then I ended up working for almost a decade in consumer goods and personal care at Unilever a company which in many ways uh, I think is like a training school for people who want to learn about business. While I was there, there were many, many opportunities to create new innovations, uh, inject new digital technology into the business, launch new brands, launch new products. But after 13 years uh, there, I, uh, you know, the tech buzz caught me again and I moved back into the tech space or the internet space with Facebook. Initially, I was leading a couple of vertical businesses for Southeast Asia. Uh, and then I was heading marketing for brands and e-commerce for the Asia Pacific region. But while I was doing that, I got to know a lot of the startups and entrepreneurs uh, in Asia. And, uh, you know, one of the groups of people that I got to know were the folks at Gojek, which is Indonesia's first super app, a great team of innovators. Uh, they persuaded me to join and I worked there building ad tech and monetization platforms for about three years. Then last year, as we all know, uh, you know, we, in the world of tech, we talk about disruption, but I think we've never seen what real disruption is until we've experienced the COVID pandemic. And that catalyzed a change in my thinking and got me to ask, you know, how can I best use my time and skills? What should I do with it? And around that time, I met uh, Gustav Agatson, who's the founder of Bima, uh, where I now work. Uh, and Bima's mission is to provide access to insurance and healthcare uh, to emerging middle class families in Africa and Asia. These are people who don't ordinarily get access to insurance or healthcare for multiple reasons. Uh, I liked what I saw. I felt this was the right time. Uh, I think we all know people who've, uh, who've had uh, tremendous impact because of COVID, family members, classmates, friends. Uh, and you know, it, just, it just crystallized my mind that this was the right sector to bring all my learning to bear. And it was a sector that was going to play a much bigger role in people's lives in a good way in the years to come. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I 
I, I can't help wondering, like I have for a long time of, you know, if all of the companies represented on this panel were to be able to get together and work in an emerging market, the power of what that means from a data capture, data analytics, then a health financing side and a, and a capital side as well. Um, but that's probably a, another thought for another day. Um, you know, starting with, um, you know, this, convers this, this question is open to everyone is what have you gained by working in the startup environment? You know, a lot of people say that, of course, there's that, that opportunity to pivot quickly, um, but what are the, how does the conversation change when you're either in a sales conversation, a partnership conversation, et cetera? And how is that different when you're coming in as a startup? And I mean, of course, you know, you're all representing, you know, very high growth, barely a startup <laughs> startups. Um, but how is that conversation different now versus when you were coming in from the corporate sector? Uh, Gabby, um, let's start with you. Yeah, look, for me, it's all about empowerment, right? I've, I've long had this belief that there are a bunch of things that we really wanted to lean in on for healthcare and we've got the, and there's no excuse, right? I can't make an excuse when I wake up in the morning and go, how are we going to fix it? I just have to get on and do it. And if there are challenges and blockers, I have to go and solve them. And I love that empowerment of, of making that happen. Um, you know, at, at Akeso, we're trying to solve the problem between the islands of care and the handoffs for patients across islands of care and just how frustrating that is. And, and that's what we're, you know, just absolutely laser focused about. And, and it's just, I'm finding it quite amazing to be that empowered and be able to be in control of your own destiny and, and do it. And it, don't get me wrong, it's not easy. Um, there are days that I wake up and I'd love the blanket and corporate support and all the resources and infrastructure around us. But I wouldn't, I mean, and I used to jump out of bed with, with vigor. I, I now basically scream out of bed and uh, just want to go and do things. And um, it's, it's cool to have that passion and, and mojo back to, to really lean in on health and just be really dedicated to it. Yeah, so maybe I can just add to that. And I couldn't agree more that that empowerment is amazing. I think the other difference is, you know, when you're when you're in a startup kind of mode and there's a decision to be made, you can kind of just make it. Um, whereas, you know, in the big corporate, you got to get five approvals and, you know, it's sometimes these decisions take a long time, but you just have that ability to to quickly, you know, like you said, Adrian, pivot really quickly. And and also um, what I find really exciting is just being with a a group of very like-minded individuals because, you know, as I said, this company does nothing but healthcare and analytics and data and outcome improvement. So, you know, you're, everybody around you has something that you can learn from. And it's just kind of amazing to have such smart, humble people that are all over the company that you can just tap into and, and learn. And I think for me, that was a big thing as well, because I'm just learning more than I have ever before. Um, that's not to say you don't learn in corporates, but I mean, after 18 years, I, I kind of feel like I kind of touched a lot of the company I was in. And here, this is just like people that have lived and breathed healthcare their whole lives. And so I just feel like I'm able to, you know, develop myself even faster than before. Um, and so, and finally, I guess the last thing I'd say is, you know, our CEO always says, you're, each one of you is an owner of this company, right? You have to wake up every day and you know, when you're about to spend money, it's no longer the corporate's money. It's like, this is your money, right? Um, and as you know, in the startup world, a lot of it, you know, and, and over time, it comes down to, you know, um, when we IPO'd, it became equity based, but it was like, you know, this, this is your money, whatever you do with it, it's going to be, <laughs> if you lose that money, that's as if you're an owner and you just lost that money, right? And so that feeling is actually, while it sounds scary, it's actually empowering too, right? Because you feel like, you have, uh, you're like a little mini CEO of your own company, right? And you're able to influence the decisions, which I think when you're in a big company, there's just so many people that are involved with decision-making. There's just so many things, but in this, you know, startup environment, you just actually feel like you can play a bigger role, right? And as Gaba said, you do everything from, you know, sweep the floor to <laughs> have the CEO meeting, right? You're doing everything end to end, you know, it's, it's there, which is also to me kind of fun as well.
Great, Suhina. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I, I echo, I mean, I think the, the same feelings really. I mean, I described it, everyone asked me, how did, how did it feel when I left Sanofi at the end of, uh, uh, end of December? And then, I mean, I enjoyed working there and I love the people, but um, I kind of describe myself as being a caged bird. And finally in January, I was set free. Um, and it's for all the reasons I think that was just mentioned before um, in terms of empowerment, agility, um, and I think, you know, sometimes when you're in a, in a very large corporation, uh, not that large corporations aren't externally focused, but they are, but you do somehow get sort of wrapped up, I would say, in this sort of internally within the company and, and you, you sort of in some ways get cocooned a little bit from what's going on outside um, and your stimulations that you get are very different. Whereas when you step out, I mean, you're just, you know, and Verona put it so beautifully with the, the way that she said it, that you, you, you're just surrounded by so many incredible uh, people with from different backgrounds, different places, trying to solve problems. And you're exposed to so much more that it really helps you, you know, when it comes to figuring through problems and, and the amount of support that you actually get from people also within the community as to, oh, how can we address this issue is just so great because you're just all of a sudden, you're outside of that, what I would say, that uh, cocoon of corporate. Reynold, I see that you unmuted yourself. So I'm assuming you have an answer in the waiting. Yes, uh, I think, you know, Gabe spoke about empowerment, um, what some people might call having a sense of agency. And I think that's a big part of what makes working in a startup attractive. Uh, Suhina just spoke about feeling like a caged bird that has been set free. Uh, curiously, we are in the middle of recruiting a senior hire from a corporate. And we said something very similar to that person uh, to try and persuade them to join us. So I've got to wait and see if, uh, you know, whether, whether they do. But that is actually, I think, a very good way of describing the feeling. I think another important part of uh, being at a corporate is the opportunity for innovation. Uh, for example, at Bima, we have you know, a huge opportunity for innovation in the space of fintech for health. How can we make it easy for anyone with a smartphone and a mobile wallet to get access to healthcare in an affordable way? If you put the two together, I think you get growth. And Farhana spoke about learning. And to me, that's a part of growth. That's a part of, you know, also the sense of ownership that she mentioned. Because startups don't have well-developed corporate functions because they are often starved of resources there are many opportunities to empower yourself and make innovation happen. Uh, recently, we had an ops manager who stepped up and said he wanted to lead growth. And of course, because he wanted to do it, he started doing it, he started producing results. And in a sense, that was personal growth for him as well. We had an analytics manager who set up our first data science team. That's how you gain new skills, that's how you grow. And I think this can happen much faster in a startup than in a traditional corporate environment. So there's one thing that you just touched upon here and, you know, it goes back to, you know, we've, at Access Health, we've worked with a number of startups over the years. Um, a lot of the startups are coming from universities. So it could be traditional tech transfer or even external, even if it's not turning, you know, university related IP into a startup, um, but maybe they, someone still has an idea for a startup. Um, and, and so whether that is a recent, someone with a recent, um, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, what have you. Um, but one thing that we've seen, you know, kind of across the, you know, the, the startup or innovation ecosystem, so to speak, is a lot of the most successful startups are people who are coming in with this industry uh, background. So it's somewhat, you know, a lot of times it's people who've worked in the industry for 10, 20, 30 years and said, we know how this industry works. We know what's working well, and we see the gaps glaring right in front of us. And that's why we want to go work in the startup to fill those gaps that we don't think that someone else is filling, or we think we have a, you know, a unique perspective in filling this. Um, but if you have these startups that are maybe a fresh graduate from university, PhD, et cetera, um, how can they entice someone to join them from the corporate world? So you almost have both the best of both worlds because um, you don't want to, you know, you want someone who, who has, if they're coming from that tech transfer background, um, how do they put together that team so they get corporate expertise combined with that, that tech transfer side as well? 
Yeah, I think it's a really, uh, it's a really good question. Um, I recently was at the University of Canterbury here do, doing a judging um, on a whole bunch of startup ideas, and they kind of had this sort of dragon's den pitching competition uh, at the engineering school. And I was just blown away by the startup ideas and the business ideas that these these sort of young grads were working on. And it's sort of, you know, they're they're about to go on their journey and they're going to learn a whole lot of things in the community that where they've got a lot of blind spots, right? And as you spend a lot of life in the corporate, you get quite comfortable in this cozy blanket and being being that bird in a cage is actually is actually sometimes quite comforting. And so actually flying out of the cage is quite dangerous. So I think the students are very happy to are already out of the cage and they're just flapping their wings and they've got wonderful ideas. We're just trying to escape out of the cage and take that first step back out of something that is that that comfort blanket. And I, I think in order to convince people coming out of corporate life, because I do think that, you know, the, the 20 years I spent at, at Microsoft taught me a huge amount. And because covering 22 markets in Asia, learning all the different healthcare systems and the different behaviors, the, the payment models, the funding models, the structural models, um, and how care was delivered, fascinating. You don't learn that at university, right? You learn that in the real world. That's highly valuable to students who need that information. Um, trying to get me out of, you know, trying to get a person out of a corporate who's in that comfort mode is actually, I think, quite difficult. You want someone that can take risk or someone that has the financial wherewithal to be able to do it and be comfortable with that risk. Um, or you just got to find that person who's crazy enough to go, yeah, I just love this idea so much, I want to do it. And I think it's one of those three. Um, but you've got to make a pretty good pitch because a lot of those people also want to do it themselves, right? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more about that uh, comfort blanket <laughs> thing that you just <laughs> talked about, Gaba. It's true. Like you, you just get into this mode. You're almost an autopilot in corporate sometimes, and you know you're just well taken care of. You don't have to think too much about you know thinking out of the box. You just have your day to day job, and so I think that whole um, you know it, it takes a unique person i think to want to jump out of that comfort zone right um and i think you just alluded to that gaba and i i personally feel like right now when i have corporates reaching out for roles you know in my company a lot of it is because of their passion as well right they they've kind of zoomed into the fact that um you know they they really love the healthcare industry they want to make an impact and you know, a lot of what we talk about is outcomes and how we quantify outcomes and, you know, how we can do that. And, you know, and, and for me, it's like our mission, our company mission is to improve the outcome of every citizen in the world, right? That's our dream to do that with a data-driven approach. And so if you find like-minded individuals who have maybe had their fair share of corporate life and enjoyed the, the comforts of it, and, and to be honest, I think the days of you know, those cushy jobs, to be honest, even in corporates are changing now. I think it's, it's not as kind of tenured as it used to be where, you know, you're, you're in there for life. Um, you know, so it, if someone is really looking for a change, something exciting, something dynamic, where you can make a difference, where you can wake up in the morning and feel like you've made an impact in this world, I think those are the kind, you have to be very targeted, I guess, is the point, you know, who you're going after from a corporate perspective. And a little bit of another question here. Um, uh, Suhina, I'm actually gonna direct this question to you, is um, we've had one question so far from the audience and to everyone else in the audience, um, there are about 60 of you. So I wanna see more, more questions, please. Um, and so, so please put any of your questions in the Q&A box um, and, and, we'll start, and we'll start getting to those questions. Um, Suhina, there's, you know, if someone comes in of, let's say you have your, your pre-startup, um, someone who has expertise um, and they have experience, they have the idea, but they're not yet at the point of prototyping. Um, how do they even go about looking at funding, fundraising? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, I mean, when it, when it comes to having a great idea and also having the experience, I think really tapping on the network. So, I mean, you want to be able to, as an investor, I want to be able to see that there's some sort of team uh, on the table. That's the first thing. 
Second thing is that they've actually tried in some way, shape or form to validate their idea. And it doesn't need to be something fancy, right? Um, it, it can be something super, super simple. And it does, you know, if it's a tech startup, you don't have to go and, and build all this complicated tech. But I mean, I, I want to know that you've actually spoken to people, that you've done some market research. You know, I think the most important thing is have you spoken to the person, the target audience? Um, and in, in some way, shape or form, you've tried to prove um, that the idea has validity because a lot of people have ideas. The question is whether the idea is valid or not, right? Um, so I think that's incredibly um, important. I think a really good example is, um, you know, um, Redmart when they first started, for example, right? They basically went and bought the groceries and delivered it themselves uh, to the customers, right? And, and that they were doing stuff with, with WhatsApp. You know, there's, a, there's another startup that I'm working with that's done a pilot and it didn't require much money. Uh, and all they did was uh, it, it's uh, something that's in the healthcare space with coaching. Um, and they got patients on board just by using WhatsApp. Of course, there's some data privacy issues with WhatsApp, but I mean, you know, they were able to test the idea and the concept was 20 people but it makes you feel comfortable. Oh, actually, you know what, they've gone out and they've made, made do with not much, right? Um, and so I think one way to look at it, and if, if, if you haven't heard of Jugard, is really look at Jugard as a, as a, as a way to look at innovating. Um, it's actually very helpful. Yeah, and another question um, for Reynolds um, is, so if someone is new to the healthcare sector, like yourself, you came from... The F and B industry, by the way, I think a lot of people should come from the F and B industry. That's how I got my start at 16 years old as well. Um, is if you want to learn about life quickly, work for a restaurant or a bar. Um, and the uh, but as someone you know from the F and B industry through to consumer products and then tech, um, and really with that high marketing role, and now you're in healthcare is how, you know, you've worked across these industries. How do you come up to speed in a completely different sector and accelerate that learning um, so that you can, so, so that you're at the point of someone who spent a lot of time in that industry? I think there are two, three ways to look at this. One is that you've got to have a mindset which is about willingness to learn, uh, but you've also got to have a mindset which is about willingness to innovate. If you look at any serious disruption to any industry, uh, from, you know, the, the, if I go back, the invention of the light bulb to disrupt candles, the invention of uh, the uh, motor car to disrupt stage coaches, it's almost always that the new technology is invented by somebody from outside the industry because they're bringing in a different perspective. Now, healthcare is a very serious area. So obviously, things to do with patient care, uh, things to do with clinical pathways, these things need to be handled by experts. But when you look at any kind of startup, you know, and I was reflecting, Adrian, on your earlier question about students versus people who come from corporates. And I think both have something to bring. The people who are new to the sector, whether they're students or experienced people, they don't know what is impossible. And therefore, they're able to come up with ideas that people who, are, who know everything about the sector can't imagine. When somebody comes in with that experience of the sector, you want to draw from their experience and expertise but also those folks need to unlearn a lot of things that get in the way of innovating at a startup. So I'd say if you put these two things together, or if you put these two groups of people together, you have a better chance of success than if you have just one of them. So, so yeah, I was just gonna say, look, I think there's, there's sort of one other thing, and this is sort of something that I've, I've learned. You, when you're doing these startups, you've got to kind of be all in. You can't be bouncing around here, there, everywhere. You've got to be deeply, deeply focused. And um, you're going to require a whole bunch of people around you that have different skills than you. People who are great at marketing, people who are great at engineering, people who are great at sales. Um, if, the, if you're missing spokes on that wheel or there's not a desire to develop those skills in, in the small team that you have, because everybody's kind of got to sell, um, and build and engineer and do things, um, I think it gets very, very difficult. So I think you want a team of people that you can work with closely because you're going to work with a small number of people very, very closely for, for quite a long time. You've got, to, you've got to find a way to get on, but you've also got to be able to be very honest with each other um, and about 
what your strengths are versus what someone else's strengths are and where I, you know, I'm, I'm very big on, I'm not good at these things, but I've got to find someone else to do those tasks um, because I'm not, ne ne I'm probably never going to be good at them. I should know by now at my age that I'm not going to be good at that task. Yeah. You know, so following up on that, you just mentioned right now is that you have to be all in and, you know, with the emphasis on tech transfer, um, you know, what would you say if there is a researcher who wants to have one foot in the startup world and one foot in the research world? Um, it didn't, you know, I, since my time at Facebook, I've known maybe dozens, dozens, maybe hundred people uh, who had this notion of starting something on the side and maybe actually out of the hundred people that I've known, not one has managed to make it take off. I find that, you know, Gab is right, that you just have to be all in. You have to take everything you've got, focus it and put it into making it happen. There may be a few lucky people, you know, uh, who who managed to get something off on the side, but I think they're the exceptions. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you, if you want to be part-time, invest in someone else to start up and then you can observe it from the side and every once, every once in a while pull your oar in. But if you want to build a startup, you have to, you have to be all in. Yeah. And Farhana and Suhina, um, really on, you know, both from the investor perspective and the corporate perspective, but then also the startups that, um, that you've either worked with or are working with right now. You know, what are some of the challenges that you see in healthcare systems, particularly for emerging markets in Southeast Asia, that you think startups are uniquely positioned to address? So maybe this comes from roadblocks that you faced in the past from the corporate world that now you can address or that you think that, that others um, can address as well. But what are some of those challenges that startups in particular um, will be able to address much quicker than potentially the more traditional corporate institutions? Yeah, so from what I've seen so far, at least in the developing markets, I mean, there's always always an issue with access, right? And there's always an issue around, um, you know, making, I mean, what I would call health equity, whereas everybody getting the right or access to good, good health care, right? Um, but I think when you think of like comparing corporates to startups, um, you know, typically startups tend to play in a more niche role. And so obviously we're seeing a lot of, interest in this whole virtual care play, right? Whereas what can you provide remotely um, as much as possible? I think another area that they can play um, a big role is in disease specific areas, right? Um, if they can zoom in, like I know there's companies just focusing on diabetes management, there's companies focusing on particular diseases. That's another kind of area that they could fill the gap. Um, the one thing I would say though, right, is that, um, one of the things that I think has been an, at least an eye opener for me is the ability to show some kind of ROI, right? Because I think um, whenever you're, you know, you have a great solution and, you know, again, coming from the corporate side, we used to provide solutions all the time. But what I think has changed in the world is that, and especially with COVID, the pandemic, with budgets being slashed, with all kinds of things, you know, if you have a solid value proposition, you know, or where you can help reduce cost and prove outcomes and show that you're going to help reduce costs by 20% or you have the ability and you can maybe go and try it out, you know, with a couple of organizations for free and get them as references. But I think that actually is, a, is something very powerful as part of your value proposition. Um, but, you know, and that's where I think when you move into these areas of, like I said, it could be vir virtual care, remote monitoring, could be disease specific, it could be focusing on diagnostics, it could be focusing on just quality improve, whatever it is. Um, I think one of the things that you should think about is always, you know, how do I quantify the results? Because how do I give this organization an ROI that is easy for them to quickly say, yeah, I should work with you, right? So those are my initial thoughts. Yeah, I think following on from that, I think accessibility and affordability is, uh, is a big issue. Um, I think where startups provide uh, a unique perspective is, um, you know, they just see things from a different point of view. I think sometimes as a large corporate, uh, you, you just don't uh, because maybe you, you are sitting in a very cushy position. Um, and sometimes you don't get to see sometimes all the time the the on the ground uh, reality. 
And I think echoing once again, I think what Brana was saying with regards to really showing that you're actually making uh, an impact, um, I think speaks volumes. Um, I think there's a lot of startups that, uh, especially when I was working uh, within, within Sanofi from the corporate perspective, a lot of them weren't able to clearly articulate the value that they actually bring to the table. Um, and whether that's from a monetary perspective, whether that's how that's impacting the quality of life of the patient. I think these are fundamental things that, you know, the startups really need to be aware of. And it doesn't need to be something fancy or crazy, but just to show that there is that uh, initial way of thinking or that there's at least some traction somewhere where you've shown some improvement and it doesn't need to be a crazy 500 patient study but you know you you can find ways of doing it even within small groups and and that automatically even within a small sample size you're automatically able to get a corporate attention saying oh actually this is interesting let's help you to try and 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 do a bigger version of this right um a, a bigger pilot um so yeah i think there's a, there's, there's a lot that can be done so there's one part Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, just a thought about this, right? Because uh, when you look at this from an emerging markets perspective, and I think for those of us who have the privilege to live in more developed countries, uh, there's a couple of ways to look at this. One is that often we see these infrastructure voids in emerging markets. There's something which as a service, the government of a developed country is providing. So you don't even think about it. You take it for granted. Then you go to a Bangladesh or an Indonesia and you'll see that it's not there. Not that the government doesn't have the intention, but perhaps that country hasn't reached that stage and that economic level yet. And I think that's where most of the opportunities for startups uh, in these places are. But then the second thing which comes from there, I feel, is often when people are coming from a developed country perspective, they're thinking developed country solutions, which is often purely digital technology. And what we see in emerging markets is you've got to have a human touch. You've got to have a hybrid of technology and people. And that seems to work better. It's actually less expensive and reaches more people. And then the third thing would be, there are things which are possible today, which were not possible even one year back or two years back, because the rate at which people are adopting new tech in emerging markets is growing. So five or six years back, you couldn't have mounted a smartphone app solution in many of these countries. And today adoption is 60, 70, 80%. And that's feasible. Fintech adoption is 30-40%, so financial inclusion is feasible. And I think the question which many of us are trying to ask now is, from there, how do we get to health inclusion? There's a few questions that have, you know, that that, that answer has, um, has, has prompted as well. But first, I want to ask a question that is... You know, Access Health, we very much, we're, we're a nonprofit think tank, but we're small and we very much operate like a startup. And so there's one question that, you know, as, as a mom with small children who um, I was pregnant with my first child when I started working at Access Health, um, this one question I felt have felt viscerally um, over the years, which is how do you manage to support your family when you made this change? And so Gaba, you talked a bit about as well as the comfort of the corporate world and others have echoed this of when you come from the corporate world and you have a retirement package, you have full benefits. And so I think this is both for the person who's gonna make the jump or the startup who's trying to convince someone from the corporate sector to make that jump. Of that comfort is not only your professional comfort but the comfort of your family. And so how, what was that process of making that jump, thinking about your family, thinking about your kids, when you went from the corporate world to the startups? I have a very understanding wife. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's um, look, I think it's, it is always nerve, it is always nerve wracking making, the, making these jumps. I, I learned a lot when I was in my late teens doing startups with no capital. Right, absolutely having no money and just realizing how that how hard that was. And when I kind of pulled pulled sticks and moved to Australia, I said I'm never doing a startup again without capital. Now these days there's a lot of fundraising that goes on. People can start startups, there's investors around, but in technology back in the in the 1990s, there just wasn't that much around outside of the Silicon Valley. So um, what the comfort of the corporate blanket gave me is some capital, right? And so I had some savings and a cushion that I could, I could afford to take the risk. I just admire people that can take the risk without the cushion, right? Because I, I just feel, I feel a bit like 
like I'm not really doing it. I'm not really doing it like a lot of startups are doing it. Um, but you know, that's been a that's sort of a comfort thing for me. Um, really, uh, I've been able to do that with some capital behind me and, a, and an understanding why. Understanding spouses really are important. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on that question? Yeah, I think it is, um, you know, I mean, it, it was a bit of a, a surprise, but then on the other hand, I think, you know, my family um, has kind of said, I haven't seen you this happy in a long time, you know, so there's, there's some benefits to it as well, where I'm working probably harder than I ever did in the corporate, um, you know, for sure, but it doesn't feel like work in some respects. I mean, it is, but it isn't because it's just so exciting and you wake up every morning wanting to do something and, you know, you just kind of, it's exciting, right? Um, what you could do. So I think, you know, a lot of it also depends on what's your passion and, um, and what makes you happy, right? And if you're a happier person at home because you're just happier with what you're doing, I think that sometimes helps, but it certainly is, um, you know, there's a lot of things you, you miss, right? In the corporate world, things are just done for you. I mean, you know, and where I was, there was, help to do your expenses and you know you had secretarial support there's none of that right you're you're your own sec you do everything which is which is fine i mean it's absolutely fine but it's just time consuming right and so you end up having to do a lot of this and i think again it just does come down to just having a supportive family um but hopefully it's it's a good new environment for you that makes you just a happier better person too so Did anyone else want to jump into that on that question, Sahina? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I think support of a spouse is incredibly um, important. Uh, nine years ago, uh, my husband sat me down in London and fed me a lot of ice cream because that's my advice. And he said, I'm decided that we're going to move to Myanmar. And so he started his, his journey and his adventure, you know, um, investing and in operating his businesses in Myanmar from scratch. Um, and uh, I mean, it really does take, the support of both people, um, and and I think having having that support, I think is is yeah, it, it makes all the difference because there are highs, really right, really high highs, um, which are amazing, and there's really low lows, um, and you really need that support of that other person to to help you get through all of those, you know, to to celebrate the wins, but also to help pick you up, uh, particularly during the times that are incredibly low. Um, and I think for those that are looking to sort of make that jump, um, there was something I, I saw which was uh, very eloquently put by one of the venture capitalists here in Singapore. And he said, you know, you can always make money, but you can never get more time. Um, and I think that is so, so true. Um, so, yeah, I think that's uh, good advice. That's very good advice. Um, and, and I think that, you know, whether someone's in the corporate world or the startup world is constantly trying to juggle that. Um, and, and that I think the last year has really shed, shed more light on as well. Um, are there, have there been any common misconceptions about joining our startups, joining or starting startups um, that maybe you had or you've seen others have that you think are untrue? Okay, I'll let you guys think about that one. <laughs> you guys can answer that one later. Um, the, uh, there, there's a very specific question um, that, uh, from the audience as well. And so I'm gonna read this out loud because it's a little bit longer, which is say you're trying to drag someone into health tech or even trying to get investor funding. They tell you public reimbursement of digital health is almost non-existent, even in developing countries like Japan, Korea, and Singapore, and ask if they're if there are even stable revenue salary streams available for health tech in the region, how would you convince this potential colleague or investor? They're not wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a really, really tough market. And um, I don't think they're necessarily wrong. I think you've got to lean in into, into the healthcare problem and, and think quite holistically about what you're trying to do. Business model is absolutely critical, but I, you know, I people have to appreciate the market size, right? And I think I've spent a lot of time in with health startups over the years, 
And you take an economy and you basically take 90% of it away because that's not health. And so you get left with 10% of an economy that's health. And within health, there's a whole lot of specializations. And so you just have to cook the cut the cookie down into the into the areas that are funded. And you've got to understand the economic model. I think the investors need to understand that you know where the, the money's going to come from and how the money's going to flow or what you can do to change the market dynamics. Um, like Reynolds was saying, that you go into new markets and create new markets where the government is not there doing it, but you're doing it. Those are real opportunities. But I think if you're just trying to sell to the existing customer base and the existing network, you've got to be very, very detail oriented around how it's going to work, how it's going to flow, because there's a lot of competition and a lot of people with great ideas all fighting for a bit of that pie, which is not the whole economy. Yeah, and I think I would add to that that, you know, and I totally agree with everything that you said, Gabba, is I, I think it comes down again to, you know, like you said, the business model. But if you can, again, prove some kind of ROI and if you really want to take a risk, do a risk share model if you want to just to get a foot in the door to say, hey, I'm so confident this is going to help you save this much money that I'll go at risk with you. Right. Um, you know, and you can pay me based on the savings or there's some some skin in the game, right? Because you need to, at the end of the day, if you're a startup and you're trying to develop a branding or people get to know you, you need to have some good wins, right? You need some good successes. And so your first couple of deals, you're, you're gonna have to possibly bite the bullet and, and invest, right? And basically get a foot in the door um, and make a difference. And so I think that's where, if you have a compelling um, ROI story where you, know, you can, Put some skin in the game with the client, um, you know, that's, that's, that's the, you know, that may be a good way to convince people that, okay, this is, if they're willing to put skin in the game, they, they obviously believe very strongly in it, right? But, but to Gaba's point, this is not an easy industry. Like, you're not going into this because it's kind of quick and fast and, you know, you're going to make a ton of money immediately. Like, this is a passion industry. Like, you have to want to improve lives, save lives, improve outcomes, make healthcare affordable, it's, it's one of those industries where, you know, it's about your soul. Um, so, yeah, if you really want to make a lot of money, go into banking, <laughs> maybe. But, um, but, you know, honestly, there's still potential. I'm just kidding. But, you know, there's still huge potential even in healthcare. But I just think, you know, you just have to be, you have to think creatively in terms of how you want to get your foot in the door, right? Now, would you... So for, um, sorry, I was gonna ask another question, but I'll wait, is the, um, so given your experience of going from corporations to startups, um, you know, when we think again about those fresh graduates um, who want to start a startup right after graduating from university, what advice would you give to them? Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, I would say putting together a strong group of advisors and mentors, um, because they will help you uh, along the way. Um, they'll help you see some of the blind spots um, that you have. Um, and I think, you know, the, what they bring to the table is really uh, invaluable. Uh, I'm kind of like, if you're a student and you want to go and do a startup, I think you've got to go and do it. Um, because you will learn so, so much that will be helpful in your career, no matter where it takes you, whether you stay doing that startup or you, or you learn from failure. I think that's the time of the li your life that you can take a lot more risks, you're more comfortable with risks, and I'd, I say just go and, go and do it. But I think, you, like Sahina said, I think you've got to validate your idea, just validate your idea um, and listen to others and learn from others. Plenty of people can, can pitch in on that journey and help you. So another question that um, that I, for Suhina specifically is that we've also seen more people leave the corporate world to become investors. Is there any particular advice that you would give to people who are leaving industry um, to start investing and going beyond just uh, the initial, you know, a bit of angel investing here and there on their own, um, but really going into to investing? Um, do you have any advice for that for those people as well? Well, I mean, it's really not an easy journey. Um, I mean, I was trying to start up the VCVB at the beginning of the year. Um, and, 
Yeah, I mean, I got faced with a lot of challenges, uh, one being not having any track record uh, at all uh, within investing, uh, being one of the biggest barriers. Uh, but that being said, I think, you know, continue to be persistent. I think the one thing that you bring from, from industry or bringing from the corporate side is the operational expertise. Um, and that's a huge value add, uh, particularly in earlier stage startups. Um, so one way is to, to also start uh, working uh, with VCs as a venture partner, perhaps, um, and then sort of working your way through. But it's not an easy journey uh, at all. Um, it's been a very it's been a very interesting journey for me. I work for a, a multifamily office, so it's a little bit different. Um, there are people that value the expertise. It just takes a lot of networking, and it's uh, it's not that easy to break into. Um, it, it, it's a challenge. I, I wish I had better advice than that, but just be persistent. I think it's very good advice. Do you have... Um... So actually, this is a very good question is less about the corporate to startup jump, but looking back on your career, would you have made the jump to corporate differently? So like earlier or doing it later, or would you have prepared differently or would you have skipped the corporate altogether? I mean, if would you have made any changes as you entered the corporate world? Or did it all go pretty swellingly? <laughs> I think in my situation, it was just perfect. Well, I mean, I probably could have left slightly earlier, um, but, you know, I mean, I believe kind of everything happens for a reason. So the timing of it probably wasn't right then, but, you know, I would have been happy to leave maybe a couple years before, but honestly, I have no regrets. I think, you know, my 18 years there were fantastic. Um, I learned so much, um, you know, being in the corporates, they, they develop you a lot. They um, especially in a place like IBM, they're big into innovation, they're projecting 10 years out, always, um, you get to meet like some of the smartest researchers you've ever met in your life. And similar to GABA, I was over 22 countries. So I mean, it was just so much experience that I don't think I would have really got if I had, you know, just spent a couple of years there. Um, and to be honest, like my big jump to be on with a bigger shock for me was going from medical research to corporate. That was like, holy cow. Um, that was a very big jump being in a lab with my rats and microscopes. As I said, that to me was a big jump. Um, but kind of the corporate to startup was, you know, a little bit of a shock, but actually it's just been fantastic. Probably the best decision I ever made. So, yeah. Reynolds. Yeah, I was reflecting on this, Adrian. And I think that, you know, the great thing about working for a corporate is that it's, it's a training school. Uh, as Farhana was saying, it's a place where you learn a lot about business. And I think that the other thing that happens in a corporate is that when you join uh, and when you're fresh, you're full of ideas, you might have some dreams, you might have some visions. The longer you stay, however, what happens is that you start to share the same dreams and visions as everyone else who works in the corporate. Uh, this is just human nature, you know, and most often those human, those, those dreams and visions are about climbing the hierarchy into bigger and bigger roles. Again, nothing wrong with it. This is human nature. But if you, however, are one of those folks where at some point you feel that your dreams are different, then that's the right time to do something different. Uh, I also think, I mean, you know, my journey has been a little easier because I didn't go from a corporate directly to a startup, a very early stage startup. I went to a corporate which had been a startup, uh, which was Facebook. Uh, by the time I, I joined there, it was already a corporate, um, but there were vestiges of the startup there. So you could get a feel for what that was like. Um, and then I went to a, corp a startup which had already scaled, which was Gojek. Um, and now to a startup, which is in the process of scaling. And so that journey for me has been easier, I think. And you know, with every step I've learned more. I think if I'd gone straight from you know, the big old world corporate to where I am now, that would have been, uh, you know, a, a bit of a harder journey. Okay, and I have one more question in the last minute that we have is when we talk about catalysts for innovation, there's one sector that has not been represented in this, um, in this panel, which is the development sector, which we know for emerging markets is a huge catalyst for innovation, especially as they start more venture funds and lead different areas. Why should development partners or development organizations, whether those are multilaterals or foundations, why should they partner with your startups? 
or with you as a funder, Suhina? Uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think you know for because for some of these, I mean, I think for some of the startups that are trying to tackle some of these problems, they're always going to have this issue. Um, especially when you're trying to address issues around accessibility and affordability at the base of the pyramid, right? Um, I think you do have people that are investing for impact, uh, yet in some cases, I think you actually do need the help of uh, foundations actually to get the balls rolling. Um, I think it's very, very hard uh, just with, the, you know, um, with individual investors alone to, to really make the necessary impact. And that could just be because of, the amount of investment that's actually uh, required. Gaba, I'm going to ask everyone this question. <laughs> yeah, um, look, I mean, I think when we look at it as a startup, looking out, looking to the outside world, we've been very focused on, on ANZ over the last while, but it's starting to look, look beyond into, into other markets as we, as we grow. And I think particularly the developing world and where the development agencies and so forth are focused, um, there is significant opportunity for, for, for innovation and I do get excited about it, but I also go, it's, it's, it's often murky. Um, some of those countries aren't totally that transparent in the way that business gets done. Um, it requires a lot of local input and you have to be able to build those relationships. And I just think development par partnerships are so critical to that because they're people that have been on the ground often for decades, understand those markets intimately and know where to, know where, you, where to start. And so for any other startup, I actually think it's, it's critical alignment, particularly well, if you're going to be focused on health, working with development partners that are focused on health or at least getting to know you because it's an extension for your network as well. Yeah, and I would I would totally agree with that. I think it just it it actually is like an extension of your your um, sales team, right? Because they already know what the problems are. They already have the ecosystem, the network, and if you can, you know, show them a solid value proposition where you're going to help them, you know, improve affordability, or you're going to help them improve access, or help cut costs out of the system, you know, they'd be, they're a fantastic way of an entry into a certain market. Um, you know, and I think like, like Gaba said, it's just sometimes very difficult in developing markets to really know what's actually happening, um, unless you do work with, you know, those kinds of development agencies that have the right connections and trustworthy connections that you can, you know, feel better working in those environments. Reynolds, how about you? I think Adrian, the key is in making sure that your goals are aligned. And um, I mean, we've had, a, we've had some cases where, you know, there's almost been a forcible alignment of goals and we've seen that that alignment process takes very long and then what gets implemented is of questionable value. But we've also had cases and you yourself are involved, I think, uh, in, in one of these cases um, where the alignment is really good and the development partners are able to accelerate things and uh, even inject some, a lot of electricity and urgency into the process. And those are cases where I think it's, uh, I see it as a, as a, it can be a tremendous accelerator for a startup that's going into an emerging market. Great. And we thank you very much. Thank you everyone for participating today. We're four minutes over because I never finish an event or a webinar on time ever. I don't think in many years of hosting these. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, if all of the panelists can just stay on for a minute or two so that Brian can get a photo. Um, that would yep. be great. And everyone who joined, thank you for joining today. Thank you so much, Adrian. I'd like to thank all our panelists for today, Fahana, Gaba, Reynold, Suhina, and Adrian for sharing their valuable insight and knowledge. A special shout out as well to the team from Access Health for their help with organizing this event. So unfortunately, we weren't able to cover all of your questions due to time constraints, but I would very much like to thank our audience today for engaging with us and, send, and sending in your questions. Do also take note that we'll be sending out a post-event email with all the important information you may need, including a, re a recording of this webinar. So do keep an eye out for that. And with that, we've come to the end of our, ses our session today. Thank you all for spending your Friday afternoon with us. And on behalf of SG Innovate, I would like to wish you all a great week, a, a, a great weekend ahead as well. And we look forward to seeing you again at our, at our next event. Bye.
Okay, uh, can you help us with the photo? Hi. Yep, hi Thank everyone. You uh, if you could just wave to the camera and look to your camera. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, three, cheese. One more. Thank you. We'll be sending the uh, image after the event. Yeah. Cool. Ah, so that's what you needed. That's that's how you take a photo. <laughs> yeah. Green cam this thing. But, uh, <laughs> but it's great. Hey, Brian, Adrian, thanks so much for having us. I really appreciate yeah. it. And Thank you so lovely, much. Lovely, to spend, lovely to spend Friday evening with some, some of you and meet new faces too. So, yeah. Likewise, great to meet all yeah. of you and cool. it was a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.